Hello, everyone. My name is Cindy Bank. I'm the Associate Director of the Program in Practical Policy Engagement. And I am um, happy to welcome you all to this event. Um, I came to the Ford School after being in Washington, D.C. for many years. Being one um, in the last 22 years, I was one of the lobbyists for the University of Michigan. And one of the best experiences I had is when um, students, staff, or faculty would come to DC to do advocacy work. And so I was really hoping um, to be able to present workshops like this to help you all learn how to be an effective advocate. And I am thrilled today to um, welcome our presenters from the Michigan League of Conservation Voters. And it really happy to have each and every one of you here. Um, we actually, two, two of the folks, um, Kip and Nicholas, I understand are Ford School alums, they're 40s. Um, Bentley is also a University of Michigan alum and Joe and Emily are dear friends of the University of Michigan, right? The um, league's offices headquarters is actually here in Ann Arbor. But I'm gonna turn it over to Kip right now. Um, and um, thank you again for joining us. And thank you, Kip, for helping put this all together. Thanks, Cindy. Um, and thank you all for uh, joining us this afternoon uh, for what we hope is a fun and informative workshop about advocacy and organizing best practices um, using some real world examples from our work at the Michigan League of Conservation Voters. Um, and a special thanks to Cindy um, for helping to organize this um, she's, a, she's a very good friend of mine and a great person and it's been fun to plan. Uh, thanks to Liz and Miriam too and everyone at the Ford School for um, helping put this on and facilitate everything. Um, and also a big thanks to, to my team at Michigan LCV. We've had a very busy uh, past few weeks and months leading up to the election. Um, and uh, everyone was enthusiastically uh, a part of putting this presentation together. So hope you enjoy it. Uh, my name is Kiff Hamp, as Cindy mentioned. I'm a partnerships manager at Michigan LCV, and I'll be serving kind of as a moderator for our presentation. Uh, and I'm joined uh, this afternoon by Nick Acapenti, who is our government affairs director, Emily Magner, our political and outreach manager, Joe Fidoa, our government affairs manager, and Bentley Johnson, our senior partnerships manager. Um, and as Cindy mentioned, uh, Nick and I are both former 40s, um, and Bentley is a U of M grad, and Emily is also. Um, so uh, we are all excited to be here. Next time we do this, hopefully it can be in person, but this is uh, still a lot of fun and we're really excited about this. Um, so we begin our presentation by talking about, you know, just kind of basically why advocacy matters, uh, why it's an important tool for all of us to utilize um, and, and how we can, can advocate in various. And then we're gonna go into um, kind of different forms of advocacy uh, within the context of, of what we do and how our organization is structured. And then we're gonna run through some real world examples of how our team has advocated uh, for and against various pieces of legislation executive orders, regulations um, about climate change and clean energy. Um, and so we decided to focus on that issue. issue. Obviously it's a big issue, um, but you know, it's one of the, the most important things we work on and, and certainly one of the biggest um, threats that we face as a country and a, and a planet. Um, and uh, know that you know, everyone here is concerned on, on that issue. So we thought it'd be a good one to use as an example as we run through this. Um, those will be some time at the end for some Q and A. Uh, so, you can hold your questions till then, and then um, we'll prompt you. You can put them in the chat box, and we'll get to as many as, of those as we can. Uh, so now I'm going to pass it over to Emily to talk about uh, why we can all, uh, all can and all should advocate. Thanks, Kip. So in a representative democracy, people have the power, the power to elect their representatives, to hold their officials accountable, and to support or oppose issues important to them. It requires that people participate in the process, and it requires that we know we are powerful. And we do this in a lot of ways, through voting for the people that we want to represent us and advocating for issues important to our community. Advocacy happens when individuals and community members speak out and take collective action around these issues and causes to influence decision makers and the policies they enact. Advocacy can take on many forms, from professional lobbyists like my colleagues, Nick and Joe, sitting down with elected officials to try to influence their decision on legislation impacting their constituents, to us rallying members through phone banks and canvassing events to make sure our lawmakers hear us loud and clear on the issues that matter. 
And all of this applies to all issue areas. A nonprofit organization may be educating legislators about the crisis of systematic gun violence. It could be students organizing a rally at the state capitol to support climate change legislation. Effective advocacy can also happen at home. When an individual makes a phone call to their local representative, urging them to vote for or against a certain bill. Advocacy matters because it is the primary path for community members to have their voice heard. And what better way to kick this off by sharing with you a real life example from one of our leading grassroots organizers in the state, Sandy, who took action and shared her story to lawmakers in Washington, D.C., in Lansing, everywhere she needs to be, she goes, and she talks about the PFAS contamination in her hometown. We'd like to share a little video for you. That might have been, uh, internet might have gone out here. I'm not quite sure what's going on. Bear with us for one second, and we'll figure this out. This is inevitable when you've practiced it and it worked perfectly. It's the law of Zoom nature. Well, perhaps we should move on without the video. That's sad. We can we can come back to it um, maybe uh, in a little bit, um, and hopefully Zach can get back on and keep sharing the PowerPoint. But um, just so we don't keep you guys waiting there for too long. Um, I'll keep going with the presentation for now. Um, so uh, thanks, Emily. And, and hopefully, like I said, if we can get back to, to Sandy and her video. She, Sandy's an amazing um, organizer, and she's really a champion for PFAS, um, which is such a critical issue in, in our state and um, all over the country. Um, so hopefully we can see that. But um, that was great context. You know, I, I think that's why advocacy is so important and it's so accessible to, to all of us. Um, you know, it's it's one of the, it's something that we all we all can do and all should do, uh, no matter our background, no matter um, the way in which we advocate. So um, now I want to kind of transition and and tee up the next part of our presentation by giving you guys some background on um, how we at Michigan LCV advocate. Um, and and to do that, I want to give you a little bit of context about Michigan LCV and our structure in case you're not familiar with us. Um, so we are uh, one of the leading nonpartisan political organizations uh, working to protect our land, air, and water in Michigan. Um, we are unique in the sense that we are actually an umbrella of organizations. So we're a 501c4 nonprofit, a 501c3 nonprofit, and also have two political action committees. Um, so this structure not only gives us the ability to advocate in various ways, uh, from lobbying to issue education, to campaign organizing and spending, but also allows us to speak, hopefully knowledgeably, um, about different forms of advocacy that we practice every day. And in this setting, uh, give us some background to give to you on various forms of advocacy. Um, so we have a great slide for this that obviously we can't show you right now because um, our PowerPoint is down, but I'll still walk you through um, sort of how, how we loop all various aspects of organization together in our work. So um, a huge part of what we do and what we spent the past you know, six months or, or more on is working to elect um, conservation and environmental champions to the state legislature, uh, the judicial branch, and when there is a gubernatorial race to the governor's office. Um, we're focused on Michigan um, and we work closely with National LCB who does our federal work, um, but our focus is, is in Michigan. And so we do that work, the election work primarily through our two PACs. Um, and we have you know run coordinated campaigns working with specific ca uh, candidates that we identify as you know gonna be like, they're re really great champions for our work um, we also have independent expenditure uh, part of the, our campaign work where we um, work not with individual uh, candidates, but on behalf of them. Um, and so uh, that's, it's a lot of work. Uh, the whole organization's involved, um, especially in the uh, Emily's team. Um, and that's a huge part of what we do in election years, um, especially. And that ties into our education work, which is uh, our 501c3 side of the organization. And this takes many forms. In an election year, a big part of what we do uh, there is meet with candidates um, to just educate them on our issues. And there's there's no partisan slant to that. There's no um, backing a certain candidate. We offer meetings to, to um, candidates all over the state. 
I think we ended up doing 66, if I remember right, this year, um, and just talked to our issues. And the benefit of that is not only that they learn about our issues and what's important, uh, but it also for us gives us, you know, potentially an ally um, when and if they're elected as someone that, you know, they know our issues, they know uh, that, that we care about them and we know that they, they are more knowledgeable about those issues because of that. Um, so that's our, our, our C3 work. And throughout, and throughout even non-election years, we, uh, we work just, you know, with uh, not just elected officials, but um, other organizations and community leaders to educate people about, about our issues. Um, and then the last part is our C4 work. And this is uh, really our accountability work. And so um, a huge part of what we do is, is hold elected officials accountable uh, for their record on their environmental uh, votes. Um, if we're talking about the legislature and, and we do similar things with the judicial branch and the executive branch. So this primarily works through our legislative scorecard, which is a digital accountability tool that lives on our website. And um, we literally track the votes of um, every sitting state senator and state representative on their uh, voting record for environmental issues. And then we can give them a grade and a score um, and make that public and, and that way hold them accountable. We also do positive accountability um, for a lot of our champions that do really good work. Um, the government, governor's uh, recent executive order around climate change being, um, being one, of, one of those examples. Um, and that accountability you know, work ties into who we endorse in election year. And so uh, our C4 team, government affairs team, Nick and Joe, who you hear a lot from today, um, uh, determine what candidates we endorse in an election year. And then that loops back into um, our electoral work. So it's this circle. And again, if we could see the slide, you would see that it really is a circle with arrows that are green that looks like a recycle thing, um, but uh, we don't have that right now. But anyways, that's, that's our organization uh, kind of in a nutshell. And so uh, now we're gonna dive uh, more deeply into those aspects of our work. And we're gonna start with our legislative advocacy work. And for that, I'm gonna pass it over to uh, Nick. Thanks, thanks so much, Kiff. And you know, I first wanna say I, I cherished my time at the University of Michigan and particularly at the Ford School of Public Policy. Um, it was invaluable. I can't tell you every single day I apply lessons learned from the Ford School. I apply uh, the processes, the techniques, and the substance of the policy issues. And I just found that period of time in my life to be a wonderful one. And the only reason I'm in the position I am right now is because of that time. So I'm very happy and honored to be back um, you know, in virtual form today presenting uh, to the Ford School um, and encourage uh, you, know, you all that have an interest in public service to, to follow it because it, it is a rewarding one. Um, even when things aren't, aren't going your way, sometimes you win and, and sometimes you lose. And that is true in the environmental sector, certainly. Um, I'm, I'm gonna speak about one piece of those three just described uh, by KIF, um, the cycle of accountability. Again, elections, issue education and lobbying. And I'm gonna uh, quickly give some more background here on, on lobbying and accountability. But as we know, you know lobbying is, seeking to influence a decision maker's position or perspective on a specific bill, a policy or action that you support or oppose. You know, in our case at Michigan LCV, that usually happens in Lansing and it involves elected officials and lawmakers, but it also involves appointed officials, administrative staff in the executive office. Um, and it happens in multiple forms, in person, by text, email, you know, over the phone in private and in public meetings and in hearings. Um, we, we also put pressure on uh, through the media. You know, effective lobbying doesn't just happen at an ask phase. You don't show up in a lawmaker's office and just um, you know, drop a big ask on a decision uh, with them. It, it involves relationship and trust building. And you know, just like any human relationship, it's difficult to communicate effectively if you're in a transactional relationship with them. Um, so you know, it happens iteratively over time and um, one can work to build those relationships. And there's all sorts of techniques which we'll share today to do that. Um, one that we engaged in recently, I can just share, you know, after the election, uh, one of the first things that we did was we called and congratulated the winners. A lot of them were returning incumbents that we already had relationships with and others were not. And that, that up moment to say, hey, you know what, you, we saw how hard you worked during the election and it deserves being recognized and congratulations on your victory. Um, what a great day, take this moment to celebrate. And, and that's it. It didn't come with you know, an ask to, to sit down and talk about clean energy. That was the end of it. And those types of interactions um, you know, over time support to building that relationship. 
You know, when it comes to making an, uh, an ask, an effective lobbyist has a lot to consider. They have to really look at all the angles. Um, the legislature is going to want to know why it's a good idea to vote with us substantively. They're going to have varying interpretations of the politics of the situation. You know, does the dis district we represent care about the issue? Do they have strong businesses that are lobbying on your behalf or maybe in an opposition or in a slightly askew uh, manner? What is their ideological philosophy? You know, we, we talk a lot about Democrats and Republicans, but there's a whole assortment of ideologies within those. So libertarians are present in our state capital, for example, and, and don't neatly fit into the Democratic Republican di divide. You know, it, it's critical to know those things going into a meeting and you know, to, to compel your, your audience um, to look at things in, in a way that will um, tap into that, that background that they find to be the most pressing um, set of influences on them. There are other ways to maximize organizational influence. Um, it, it's not just the, the lobbying in person uh, by professionals that works. It's very compelling to connect the lawmaker, the decision maker directly with their constituent. You know, we had the video about Sandy that didn't work unfortunately for us today, but who is in their district um, that can put a human face to a story? That's one thing when I talk about the parts uh, per trillion that PFAS represents in a water supply. It's another thing when Sandy speaks about how her and her husband um, had cancer and it, it directly related um, in the science to uh, the correlation with the PFAS chemical in the water supply. And to tell that, to tell that story from a personal perspective uh, puts a face and human emotions to the facts that an organization is, is responsible for presenting. So that's just a little bit of a flavor of that, you know, one of those three pieces, the, the lobbying and accountability flavor. And I'm gonna hand it off to Emily here to talk about another piece of that accountability triangle that uh, Kif referred to, which is community organizing and advocacy. Emily? Thanks, Nick. So as you all can probably imagine, Nick and I's work really goes hand in hand. If he's telling us as a professional lobbyist that stories are the most compelling tools for them to share with the lawmaker, it's on us who work directly with the community to connect them with those stories. Now, we all know that the halls of Lansing aren't the only place to create change for our state. That power comes from our backyard. In an ideal democracy, the legislature's work is reflective of the work that must be done in our communities across the state. That being said, this work can manifest in a few different ways. So we may be working uh, to engage the community, for instance, during lame duck. And we may be asking these communities to oppose imminent legislation. This is specific and it's focused on a, on a piece of legislation. Or we may be in a community focusing on large scale capacity building by organizing around an issue area rather than a specific piece of legislation. So we know that the issues that folks in our state face vary greatly depending on where you live. From water shutoffs in Detroit, to shutting down line five, to building support for PFAS maximum contaminant level restrictions in our state. This is accomplished by a few different methods of interacting with the community, largely considered best practices. So to educate our neighbors or to ask them to join us in taking action, we phone bank. We knock on doors with a canvas, or we attend a rally as an entry point to the movement. This work is slow and steady, and it takes many of us doing it together to make it effective. But when we do that work together, I can tell you this in my career, I've been doing this work for about 14 years. I have seen communities move mountains on behalf of bills and on behalf of, of issues. And so by engaging and educating the public, we're affecting change that it will still likely, in fact, lead to legislative or electoral wins on behalf of our issue area. But how do we build a movement? It's not an accident. And it takes a whole lot more than sending in postcards or signing petitions or even showing up to one protest. It's methodical and it's premeditated. Organizations like ours invest year-round in the leadership already existing in our communities. 
And it will take this type of continual year-round investment to affect long-term change. And so let's talk about how we do it. The leadership ramp of engagement is generally the gold standard for how do you start from talking to two people to having 50 people ready to take action. And so these are methods for building genuine non-transactional relationships that we foster. And when I say non-transactional, it doesn't mean that they don't do things on behalf of our movement or our organization. It means that it's a reciprocal relationship. But as you can see here, you know, it isn't just one-sided. We may uh, start out by meeting at a public event. And then what we do is we, you know, in this case, I'm going to use a specific example because I'm a big believer in specific examples, is I went to an event organized by high schoolers around climate. And it's called IPVR, In-Person Volunteer Recruitment. From there, I said, hi, will you sign this petition and join the Michigan League of Conservation Voters? And they're like, yeah, who are you? Let's do it. And then they sign up, and then I call each of them within 24 hours. And I say, hey, do you want to grab a virtual coffee? You know, let's talk. Let's, let's know each other. And then they're like, hey, you're not the worst. Why don't you come talk to our student group? Then, of course, I do. And then more people sign up. And then I invite them in to say, okay, you know, we have to actually enter that data from the event that you threw so that we can call people and invite them into the movement. And so then I've trained these high schoolers on how to do data entry in the van, which is the Voter Activation Network. From there, they phone banked. They did a volunteer recruitment phone bank for a canvas where they invited people to knock doors. And in this case, it was um, in support of the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. And so they were so excited that they got all these adults to say yes to knocking doors, they decided they wanted to do it too. And so they knocked these doors. And all the while, I'm getting to know these young people. I am listening for their superpowers. I am learning about them. I am basking in their light and reminding them how powerful and incredible they are. It's a reciprocal, genuine relationship. They had never even heard of Lizzo. And I, I, ma I made sure to bridge that gap. But from there, they knock doors, they're getting comfortable, they're understanding that there's processes to activism. And so I said, you know what, you all are so incredible. What do you think about attending our train the trainer training? It's a mouthful. And they're like, okay, that's cool. And so we trained them how to do a training. And then we had them, our young people, they were both 16 years old, co-presenting a, a pop training that we did, a pressure on politicians, how to talk to your lawmaker. And from there, we have them training adults on how to tell their story of self, how to take the passion that they had for an issue area and translate it into a meaningful, moving conversation with the lawmaker. From there, we kept investing. We invited them to more community organizing opportunities. We re-engaged them after a break. It's all very methodical. And you know, we write them letters of recommendation, and then it starts over because you know what? They invite their friends to join. And so it is, it is incredible to see what happens um, when, when we do this work. And so as you can see, it's very intentional. We're intentionally growing this movement. And understanding this leadership ramp of engagement is actually one of the biggest struggles that I've seen young community organizers and advocates in the field do. This is an area that nonprofits really, really struggle with. And so it's all about creating those avenues for community members to be heard and to take on leadership roles. And to be clear, all forms of taking action are not created equal. I've highlighted a few of them here, which are widely acknowledged as the most impactful methods of engagement. Community phone banks, canvassing door to door, calls to legislators, lobby day events, the closer you can get to talking to someone in person, the more effective you are at communicating to them what you need them to remember. And I also want to add that there is a difference between advocacy and activism. Advocacy is strategic. It's a social science. It isn't a one-time event, and it builds off of institutional work to leverage the most power for a community as possible. It's all about creating opportunities to invite community members 
to take meaningful action on behalf of their own communities. And now I'm going to hand it over to Joe. Awesome, thank you, Emily. Um, and you guys are hearing one of the from one of the best organizers I've worked with uh, in my years uh, in, in politics, Emily Magner. So um, you guys have a treat today. So you know, I want to build upon what Nick was saying. Uh, you know, lobbying is important, absolutely, and that's a lot what Michigan LCB does uh, to advocate for our interests. But we don't stop there. Just as important to lobbying uh, is actually meeting with these legislators and candidates. Uh, to simply educate them on an issue without specifically asking uh, their position or, you know, to vote a certain way on the bill. Um, it's perfectly legal to do, perfectly legal for um, 501c3 organizations to do this kind of work, and they do. Um, the types of groups you may think of as, as uh, nonprofit actually do have the ability to meet with decision makers and educate them simply on the policies and issues that may end up be becoming uh, legislation or executive action in the future. Um, you know, it's, it's not lobbying. Uh, there's there's plenty of space between the two. Um, you know, sometimes the issues we work on are complicated, especially for legislators who come from a variety of different backgrounds before they're legislators. Um, many different professions, uh, I mean, you name it, we have, it's cliche to say for sure, but we do have nurses, we have insurance salesmen, we have, we have I think we even have a dairy farmer in the legislature. So they're coming from all sorts of backgrounds. A lot of them just simply don't have the scientific background that's that's really needed to dive into the policy on our issues. We happen to advocate for environmental conservation issues, which are technical at times. Uh, one of the most glaring examples of this in our world right now is educating them on, on PFAS and water quality. Uh, we spent hours and hours educating candidates on PFAS and its effect on public health, uh, what we can do about it to solve the crisis, what is it uh, in a nutshell. Um, you know, the best example, what, what recently happened was based on our educations on PFAS, we had a, a candidate up in Northern Michigan, a Republican candidate running for office. We sat down with him for an hour, just simply talked about PFAS in a nonpartisan, didn't ask him uh, you know, to, to, to give us anything. Um, he ended up building that into a candidate forum two days later, referenced our meeting, was well-versed on all these you know, intricate positions that we laid out to them. And that's an example of when, when just simple issue advocacy can be effective. I mean, you can have candidates build this into their campaign platforms just based on knowledge. So for us, it's not just PFAS. You know, obviously we have issues like clean energy, air quality, all these require some scientific understanding uh, that, that we provide to help decision makers uh, come to a final conclusion. Um, it helps prime them, you know, to adequately address these issues if they're ever put before them. So they're not doing, you know, they're not doing this work on the back end. They can be ready to go uh, for the next session. It also helps to simply ed, uh, elevating our priorities in their minds. You know, once it's a priority for them, that might trickle up to their leadership, their legislative leadership, uh, who may build it into the legislative agenda, which is going to help us out uh, down the road as well. So I uh, just want to highlight uh, the importance of issue education in addition to lobbying, I think they, they pair one and the same. I think they're they're both uh, necessary and required to be effective. Um, and with that, I'm gonna get you back over to Kiff and he's gonna set the stage for what real world advocacy looks like. Thanks, Joe. Uh, thanks, Emily and Nick too. Um, that was a great run through of, uh, of sort of different forms of advocacy and, and how, you know, with some examples mixed in there of how we do it at, at MLCV. Um, before we go to this next section, though, we did want to uh, loop back and show you this video of of Sandy um, again, one of our one of our you know best grassroots advocates that, that we know, and so I think it's really worth showing and ties into a lot of uh, you know the stuff that, that Nick, Joe, and, and Emily have just been talking about. Um, and apologies again for the uh, snafu there in the PowerPoint. Now we we know what this whole virtual teaching thing is like. So if your professors have done this, then uh, cut them some slack. But um, so let's run the video, and then we'll come back to uh, to this next section in a second. In September, advocates across Michigan headed to Washington, D.C. to urge the U.S. Senate to act on PFAS and protect us from this dangerous forever chemical in our drinking water. These are their stories. The three of us came here and, and just made the decision to come here on our own, not connected with any group or anything. Was We wanted to put a face to this issue. Um, that's had some serious health crises and serious property value losses. And what I want my elected officials to do is to design a comprehensive way to address this um, and fund that accordingly. Once the Flint lead crisis came out, it had to be a concerted effort by everybody. And this is going to have to be the same way on a federal level. 
um, five to ten years, we can decide if it's a hazardous chemical. Um, you know, my blood levels are so high, the joke around my neighborhood is they're waiting for me to die anyway before they do anything. So I, I think that's kind of absurd. I, I work in government, actually. I work for community mental health. It doesn't need to take that long. When there's a crisis, when Katrina hits, you can manage it. You can, you can respond. So they can respond to this. That's just delay tactics, if you ask me. So there you go. Um, yeah, we, we're closer to Sandy and she's a true champion um, on, on the PFAS issue. Um, and, and she's been personally affected uh, very much. Her, her husband passed away from cancer. She, she's had complications as well. Um, and, but she's really you know, been an advocate uh, in Michigan and nationally um, for, for identifying this as a dangerous substance that's, that's in, all over the place and something needs to be cleaned up and addressed and um, identified in, in various uh, water, food, packaging, all the, all the ways that it comes into our lives. And so um, we definitely wanted to get, get that to you. And it, and it really does show, you know, going to DC and advocating and, and um, just as a, as a person who's been affected is such an effective thing to do. Um, so God, we got to do that. So now we're going to move on to the next kind of set, uh, part of our uh, presentation. And we're going to uh, run you through kind of a real world example or examples um, from our work at MLCV um, about what advocating uh, looks like. And this is going to take us up to the Q&A session at the end. Um, so uh, coming up, Nick, Joe, Emily, and Bentley will walk you through uh, kind of the process of advocacy from start to finish, highlighting work that uh, they and their teams have focused on in recent months and years uh, to combat the ongoing climate crisis and our kind of clean energy work uh, more broadly. So Nick and Joe will speak to the legislative and lobbying aspect of our work. Um, Emily will talk about the importance of community-based organizing and Bentley will give us uh, some insight into what it's like to work with a legislative staff member. Um, he used to work for Senator Peters and so has a lot of uh, insight on that. Um, and as we go through this, I just wanna you know, point out that um, you know, we're, as I mentioned at the beginning, kind of an organization of, of multiple organizations. And, and so we'll talk to the, you know, to, to the work uh, on the organizing side, on the legislative side, uh, but it's important to remember that these things you know, in the way we advocate um, really happen together. You know, when they're done, done most effectively, it's not, you know, Emily's not doing her thing and then Nick's and Lansing doing his thing. They're done really in concert. So whether it's, it's Emily taking direction from Nick on an issue that we really, you know, want to focus on uh, based on a piece of legislation that we, we want to support. Um, and then Emily goes and, and gets community support and builds a coalition and really gets, you know, voice behind that uh, bill to support or oppose, oppose it. And the other times Emily will reach out to Nick and, and say, you know, um, there's an issue that's really important in this community. You know, can you go talk to the, the state representative um, and, and you know, try, to, try to work with them on that side of it? Um, so just keep that in mind as we walk through this. This is all, uh, you know, when done well, um, done in, in cohesively. Um, so now I'll turn it over to Nick to get us going. Thanks, Kit. I'm going to jump in and, and handle the uh, next section here, if you don't mind. Uh, I think the first step in the process here, we need to identify the issue to focus on and why it's a problem. I think that's the first step. Before we get any further on, on strategy, I think we identify what we're looking at here. As you guys can probably guess, uh, we at uh, Michigan LCD spent a ton of time thinking about clean energy, resources on climate policy, resilient communities to, to, uh, to adapt to climate change. Uh, so the purposes of this um, you know, example here, I think we'll use the governor's recent climate EO executive order as a case study to kind of, uh, you know, to underscore uh, how we perform advocacy and how, you know, I don't want to say best practices, but some effective, uh, you know, cases where, where it's worked for us, at least. Um, the climate change, as you know, is, is one of the biggest threats we face. Uh, in Michigan, we've seen uh, some of the wettest years on record recently. We've seen high lake levels causing coastal erosion, extreme heat days, extreme storms. You guys remember the, the polar vortex from a couple of winters ago. Uh, we contribute a lot of this to climate change. Uh, but as big as a problem it is, is, it is, climate change is also a massive opportunity if addressed properly. We spend a bulk of time advocating for strong policy to facilitate the de development of clean energy, energy efficiency, and electric vehicles. Uh, clean energy policies are good for the air and water, uh, save ratepayers money, can grow jobs and opportunities in Michigan, and also um, you know, reduce the U.S. dependency on foreign oil. So it's important to remember we can't view these issues in a vacuum. 
uh, when we're dealing with them. We need diverse strategies and approaches to solve the climate crisis and any other environmental issues we advocate for. So, you know, now that we've identified the goal, in this case, climate policy, uh, we need to determine what we need, what we want policy policymakers to do to solve the problem. So fortunately, in this case, uh, I don't want to say we were cheating here, but we had uh, Michigan LCV had some really strong existing relationships with uh, Governor Whitmer's administration, who we who we knew would be uh, the main target to move this climate policy. So we did play a huge role in helping uh, to elect her in 2018. Uh, that helped some of these relationships. Uh, we knew she had an existing commitment to address climate change and other environmental issues that we care deeply about in Michigan. Uh, but even with her commitment to solving the climate crisis, she and her team around her, uh, they still needed some strategic and technical support to craft an environmental agenda during her first term, uh, while also embedding climate change into that agenda. So, you know, we supported, uh, the support we provided, including uh, recommendations, uh, we put together a package called, that we call the environmental roadmap that her advisors have been using for the first two years of her time in office to keep them on track uh, to address our state's most pressing public health and conservation issues. Uh, with so much going on in the Whitmer administration, elected officials in general, as you probably uh, can guess at this time, fighting off pandemic, pandemic response, they have a ton to deal with. It's, it's really important we keep them on track uh, and be, stay in constant contact with them, uh, keep them accountable, uh, while urging them to, to, to really stay on track for our agenda as much as possible. Uh, our team does check-ins with high-level staff within the administration on a weekly basis uh, to review policy made uh, on policy outlines, like, you know, for example, on that roadmap uh, I mentioned um, that we provide. And we also offer additional support and technical ex expertise. So whatever they need, they can lean on us. So lastly, once we determine what we want the policymaker to do, we need to know our target audience and determine uh, you know, who the authority is, that who has the authority to achieve our intended goal. So who in the, in the governor's administration did we initially focus on? Well, again, we were, we were fortunate to have some really critical relationships. One of the governor's key uh, policy advisors, actually her environmental policy advisor, used to be a, a Michigan LCD staffer. So that definitely helped. Uh, so she was front and center with helping craft the administration's environmental policy, as well as um, uh, the main driver behind crafting the, the climate EO. Uh, we also had existing relationships with some of the other uh, governor's high ranking staff, her deputy chief of staff. We, we had relationships with, with her dating back to her time in the legislature. Also, a lot of other partner organizations we've worked with end up um, ended up in the administration. So this is a perfect example of the importance of maintaining these long relationships long-term relationships, uh, the professional relationships you build in Lansing or DC or wherever you, you'll end up working, maintain those. Um, you never know where your colleagues, your interns, you name it. You never know where people are gonna end up. Uh, they may be your enemies uh, opposed to you on an issue one day and you may uh, find them as an ally on another issue the next. So with that, I'm gonna give it back to Emily. She's gonna discuss how to best target community members and constituents to help us achieve these shared policy goals. Thanks, Joe. So I always like to remember this. People come because they care about your mission and they stay because they care about the people. I want to refer back to the leadership ramp of engagement again. That is the recipe for continued relationships with local advocates. And in this case, that example was with young people. Fostering these types of relationships are critical to the movement. Since creating that on-ramp, those high schoolers have multiplied. They have taken on critical volunteer leadership roles during the election. One of them completed more than 60 volunteer shifts. They are literally so good that they can launch phone banks. They can do tech support. They're incredible. They couldn't vote, but they knew their power. And we couldn't have done that effectively with now knowing and honoring our audience. We need healthy grassroots movements to create a widespread culture of support, which matters when we start to see climate-focused legislation, citizen-led climate movements, and a changing worldview on, climate, on the climate crisis has played a big role in someone like Governor Gretchen Whitmer being able to have an executive order that hits so close to home. And I'm gonna hand it back over to Joe to talk a little bit more about what the process looks like on their end. 
Thanks, Emily. So now that we know our goals and our targeted individuals um, that we want to that we that we think are influential uh, to getting our intended intended goals, we got to find those opportunities in the right timing um, to, to achieve these goals. So you know, in our case, I go back to this example of the climate EO. We knew, given the the uh, party controlling the le Michigan legislature right now, really didn't have uh, climate action on the top of their agenda. It'd be really difficult to do uh, legislatively. So we really honed in on uh, executive action and administrative action solving this problem. So first we had to figure out the governor's agenda, her priorities, her timeline, what her calendar looked like uh, for the first few years, particularly this year. We targeted this year in 2020 as uh, the year we really thought we could uh, get, get the climate EO rolled out. And we hope, hope to have it rolled out, to be honest, at the beginning of the year, the beginning of 2020. But, you know, with, with the graveyard of policy priorities that uh, that is 2020, uh, it took us quite longer than we expected to get that rolled out. Um, but we quif quickly shifted um, to the governor's team uh, on the climate EO, not only from an environmental angle, but we pitched it through a clean jobs and recovery lens. I mean, with so many people filing unemployment claims throughout the state, we, we thought the governor could have some great messaging through, you know, getting people back to work, getting them good and high paying jobs, getting people retrained, uh, to work on clean energy systems. So uh, that was kind of our pitch. It did help, um, you know, we, we kind of pointed to the Biden campaign. Uh, they rolled out a, a, a climate policy plan as well throughout the summer. So we said, look, I mean, they're dealing with, with pandemic response and it, it's doable, right? You can have both, both messages at the same time. So uh, we also partnered with a number of organizations who shared our climate interest. And this is where coalitions are important. Um, not just environmental groups, we got outside of the traditional allies and uh, traditional coalition members, uh, but we really uh, got together with non-traditional folks, the business interests, the, the, the solar panel installers, the, you know, the conservative energy folks with free market principles. We got all them together, uh, had them all, everyone pressured the administration as much as possible and in a friendly uh, manner, uh, but we really wanted to row in the same direction get all these interests aligned and to put to have the most uh, pressure on the administration as possible to get this done uh, fairly quickly. So uh, takeaway here, I think, is coalitions do matter and be creative with the coalitions you build. It doesn't have to be in your, in your specific sector. I mean, we don't stick to environmental organizations, but we do have a great relationship with them in Michigan. But um, but if you really want to be effective, you got to build those broader, broader coalitions here. So uh, I'll get it back to Emily one more time. I know we're passing this back and forth here, but I'll get it back to Emily. She's going to talk about building these strong coalitions through com community organizing. Yeah, just a couple of things to add to that. So, you know, I attended the University of Michigan School of Social Work. And so I come to this field with a social work perspective and background. And so something that you would hear me if we work together say over and over and over again is we have to meet people where they're at. So show up to meetings, introduce yourself to people, go to rallies and bring a sign up form for you to call people back to later engage them on their issue. Be aware of the space that you take up, be respectful. How you enter a community matters and how you build coalitions matter. Be aware of your privilege. Had I not known that it was my job to pass the mic to the youth at their very first climate strike, they would have dismissed me and they wouldn't have asked me to come to talk to their student group. They asked me to speak at the event. I didn't go to them to claim my space. When I spoke, I reflected back to them that they are powerful. These are really nice things to do, but they're also strategic things to do. You know, there may be, again, those couple days a year where, where they are really bumming about not being able to vote, but the more we can remind them that they have ways that they can tr contribute to the world of advocacy, the better. And I think another thing to note about coalition is it's really worth noting that there is a lot of room for community collaboration. We aren't competing, we are building together. And it's important to keep that centered in your work. Advocacy and community organizing it's all about utilizing best practices and not reinventing the wheel. And this really extends to how we find the folks we're going to do this work with. And then I'm gonna bounce it back to Joe. Okay, hot potato. So yes, legislative, legislative champions are what we think about. When we're talking about building power, when we're talking about uh, 
policy making, uh, having some policy wins. We always think about finding those legislative champions, getting something you know passed through the legislature and signed by the executive. What happens when you don't have those legislative champions? Um, and I'll keep going back, back to this example here. As I mentioned, um, we didn't have a ton of influential legislative champions that were, that were in the majority's leadership that were lining up to really solve the climate crisis. It just wasn't there. Uh, and we knew that. So who were our champions? So we, we really steered, um, again, shifting to our administrative strategy, not just the governor herself, but we, we took a holistic look at this. How do we, um, how do we take a, a comprehensive look at, at state government in general? So we, we partnered with um, the director of Eagle, the, the Environment, Great Lakes and Energy, director of DNR, uh, Department of Natural Resources, and then uh, Department of Health and Human Services. You can write a last show too. Um, Michigan is having internet trouble today, friends. <laughs> yeah, this is crazy. Sorry, everybody. Um, this is what happens in these Zoom presentations. Um, so, well, Emily, we can, uh, Nick can, or Joe can, can hop back into this when he, uh, when he gets back on, but do you want to go to the uh, coalition building part? I'm ready for this. So messaging is a really important part of how we do the work that we do. And so how do we identify a message that would be effective in bringing on partners, volunteers, community members? How do we do that? You know, when we're working with a coalition, I think it's really, really critical to the health of that coalition to be able to form consensus around language and a healthy process for discourse and decision-making amongst that coalition. I can tell you this from experience, People struggle with this. And I can also tell you that I've seen it done really well. But my favorite example of, of, of a really healthy coalition is um, the work being done around shutting down line five with the oil and water don't mix coalition. It's a hybrid group of local and statewide organizations that collaborate with incredible respect and incredible efficiency. You know, they move as one unit. They have an entire process for how they communicate, how they agree upon messaging, and how that messaging is delivered. And it's really um, been very effective for youth really across those organizations because of that culture of consensus. And so that being said, now I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Bentley to talk to us about how we approach decision makers. Thank you, Emily. I Appreciate that. Yeah. And um, as a recovering uh, Senate staffer uh, for Senator Gary Peters, um, you know, hindsight is really helpful. Um, but while I was in the um, while I was in the senator's office, you know, he he is a decision maker and the staff is inundated with information and a major challenge for him was filtering through the information, filtering through the different messages and de determining what that criteria is to, to make a decision and very tough decisions or very minor decisions, even like, uh, uh, you know, at whether to join an event or, or uh, what to order at the event, like what flavor of frozen yogurt to order, uh, which is the type of decision that makes Veep, I think, the most realistic uh, political show. But you know, what are those things that they're looking that they're looking for when they're making a decision? Um, there's really no substitute for all the pieces that um, my teammates have, have laid out today, but you can work through the office and you can get their attention. Um, and one of the best ways to do that is to go through the staffers and staffers are, you know, likely to be knowledgeable um, in many ways, more knowledgeable than than the decision makers on a particular issue because they may be specialized uh, within the office. But with that said, they likely don't have a deep understanding of the particular issue, especially in, in you may have, there's a good chance that you'll be more knowledgeable um, if you've taken the time to uh, you know, carry that issue to the office. So um, all the more important 
uh, to apply the lessons of relationships matter. So as you're approaching a staffer in a lawmaker's office, I think there's a few things to, to keep in mind uh, to get off on the right foot. You know, know that there are a lot of staffers that have different roles. So it's important to understand who you're t- talking to and reach the, the most appropriate staffer, you know, the staffer that covers uh, the, a particular committee that your bill is going through or something like that. Um, it's also important to approach each interaction as an opportunity to work together. You know, just like if you were to try and build a relationship anywhere in your life, you don't want to start out you know, super aggressive and combative, but I think you're looking to come across as polite and friendly, but firm, you know, and you're there to, you're, you're there to advocate. Um, and then, um, as we've talked about, have a clear purpose, a clear ask, uh, and, but be ready to defend your view, you know, don't be surprised if there's a back and forth, um, and that you're, you know, you're questioned or put on the spot, but, you know, be honest about what, uh, you know, and what you don't know, and that, that credibility will carry forward, uh, and you'll become a trusted resource that they, they know they can get, go back to you and get accurate information and get a good, get a good take. Um, and so another way to, earn the respect and trust of staffers and be, become that resource is help make their job as easy as possible. They're trying to do a lot. They've got a lot on their plate. They're doing a lot of meetings. Um, and at the end of the day, they need to be able to z- distill down an issue to basically a one page memo that they put in front of the, their boss, you know, the decision maker, the Senator in, in my case, and, so that the Senator can read in a short time, get to the heart of the issue and make a decision or go back and get some more information. But um, so what is that kind of criteria, you know, distilling it down? It's things like a brief, like let's take for instance, co-sponsoring a, you know, a climate action bill or a clean energy bill, you know, um, a brief overview, a, a brief overview of the bill obviously is necessary description, but also who asked for, for the support, you know, Michigan LCV requested uh, your support on this bill. The lead co-sponsors are this, the existing co-sponsors are this. Here's the impact on on Michigan and people in Michigan. They also want to know where the other stakeholders are. You know, so-and-so is supportive of it, but, you know, so-and-so is against it. And you've got to kind of weigh those, um, the cost benefit and the pros and cons, just like any other big decision in, in, in someone's life. And you have to know, uh, like Joe was talking about the process, the procedural posture. You know, the bill was introduced on this date, referred to this committee, the markup is scheduled, you know, next week. So we have an opportunity to, you know, maybe shape it a little bit. Is it part of a larger, could it be part of a larger legislative package that could, um, you know, go to, uh, you know, go, go and pass through, uh, you know, the chamber and go on to be a law? Um, and so understanding the, the, the procedural posture will help determine what other steps you need to do to get across the finish line. And at the end of the day, they make that recommendation. Um, but I think a lot of us that have, have done advocacy or even people that have just dabbled in it a little bit um, feel like, well, I feel like, are they really li- listening, paying attention? Like I felt like I was, I made a, you know, I sent a letter, I, you know, got a form response. And what are some of the best tactics uh, to cut through the noise and to get heard? You know, letters and postcards, like Emily said, you know, not really that effective because, you know, they get a ton of them, put them in a stack, send a form response. You got to have, you got to have that um, either the time on the phone and really kind of disrupt their, you you know, usual day um, or, find creative ways for that um, one-on-one time, that FaceTime, more tr- tricky in, in a pandemic, but certainly possible. Um, you can also do little uh, tricks or shortcuts, like, you know, if it's, a, if it's a DC lawmaker, you know, go to the district office. They're not as used to getting as many calls or meeting requests, and you might be able to get up the chain a quicker that way, or show up to a decision maker's town hall in their district, where they may see the same 10 people every time, But if you show up and show up in numbers, that'll get their attention for sure. And then um, other tools like like media, um, our media pressure is just absolutely critical. Um, Social media can be a really effective tool, but social media is also very noisy. 
There's a lot of trolls. There's a lot of hot takes on social media. So I think it has to go along with building that relationship and all the other pieces. And then the last thing I'll say is messengers. And we got, we got to that a little bit with, with talking about coalitions, but you have to think about the messengers that are going to resonate with your, um, decision, your targeted decision maker, whether it's a business leader, a community leader. And we really, um, our understanding and, and, and um, uh, the environmental movement, I think especially is uh, needing to reckon with, uh, we need to be having community leaders, especially impacted community letter- leaders, those disproportionately affected by um, toxic contamination, um, particularly in black and brown communities, uh, indigenous communities um, at the forefront, because they are the ones that are it, it, literally a matter of life and death. So um, all that factors into, uh, you know, the most effective messengers. And um, to talk a little bit, you know, a couple other tips about messaging to volunteers and community l- leaders, I'm going to pitch it back to uh, Emily here. Thanks, Ben. So on our end in this world, it's really important, once again, what is my mantra? Meet people where they are at. And that absolutely applies to messaging. Most of us aren't policy wonks. That is just the truth of the matter. And one of the biggest barriers that we have to regular folks getting involved is that they don't think they know enough about policy or politics to impact those systems that are impacting them. So fun fact, advocacy is actually kind of a dirty word. Most people don't use the word advocacy in their daily lives. It's kind of considered jargon. And when you ask focus groups to reflect on the word advocacy, they think it's elitist. They don't like it. So when you're communicating with volunteers or community members, you need to be using accessible language that people identify with that will deliver your message from anyone from a high schooler to an 85-year-old who is wanting to get involved. If the language isn't accessible, you can mean well all day long, but you aren't inviting people in effectively. And this goes back to one of the community norms that we use in organizing, which says assume best intentions, but honor the impact. That norm applies to many different ways on how we do this work, but in this context, it's especially important. So how do we execute these these forms of communication? You know, step one is find your community and do the hard work together. I said it earlier, people come for the mission and they stay for the people. You have to create genuine connections because at the end of the day, we're all passionate people who want to see the world better. And this isn't just about getting a call in. This isn't just about numbers. This is about making a genuine connection from me to you saying we can do this when we go together. And so again, that's why we lean on community organizing best practices to make sure that we're keeping folks engaged. For instance, before every phone bank, we talk about the importance of the work and we center ourselves on the mission. And that's why at the end of every phone bank, we debrief as a team to celebrate each other's wins and to shake off the difficult conversations. Because, fun fact again, this work is really hard, especially in this political environment. It's very polarized. There are people who aren't thrilled about getting a political phone call. Can you believe it? I can't. But we know that this work is hard. One person may have done one shift and maybe they only had two good conversations with voters, but maybe someone else had a few more. It's about understanding the importance of collective work, slow and steady, because those conversations and those votes add up. It's not just about what you've accomplished in your hour or two hours volunteering. It's about what we were able to accomplish together. You know, this work is all about finding ways to not rebuild the wheel. 
whatever issue area matters to you, there is likely someone like me out there looking for you. So get involved with issues like, with organizations like ours that exist to protect. Take collective action. Do the hard work and build community as you go. You know, I want to kind of reflect back earlier to, to Bentley saying, do they listen? And I'm going to be frank. Sometimes they do. And sometimes they don't. But either way, your time and your energy spent on sharing with them what their community thinks on an issue is of critical importance, whether or not they agree with you and whether or not they're going to change their vote. Be willing to talk to them. And I would actually like to show you how easy it is to make a phone call to your lawmaker. Um, not to put you on the spot, but Kip, would you mind coming off mute and do a very quick role play with me? Of course not, Emily. That sounds great. Thank you. Okay, so I'm calling you. Ring, ring. You're the governor. <laughs> I'm in a rivers office. How can I help you? Hi, my name is Emily Magner, and I live at Bloody Block Street in Traverse City, Michigan. And I'm calling today to thank Governor Whitmer for her climate-focused executive order. Addressing climate change matters to me because someday I might want to reproduce. And in that case, I would very much like an earth that is habitable. So it really means a lot to me that she did this. So I just want to say thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for calling. I'll be sure to let her know. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time. You too. Have a great day. Yeah. This takes like 30 seconds, but I can tell you when these calls come in fast, it matters. You know, as I'm sure any of these guys who have worked in Lansing can attest, legislators and even the governor takes note when their phone starts to ring. Why? Because it's disruptive. They have to stop what they're doing to record the reason behind your call. And this is an extremely important tactic, not just when we're thanking someone to reinforce the behaviors we want to see more of, but this is really important during times like lame duck, which is often used as an opportunity to ram incredible amounts of often harmful legislation through the legislature. And in those cases, us, you know, us phone banking and calling into those communities where there's a lawmaker who's undecided on their vote can actually be the difference between a win and a loss. Slowing that process is important for our communities to take action. So uh, I'm going to pass it over to Joe. Thanks again, Emily. And sorry, I lost you guys for a little bit, but I'm back. So thank you for bearing with me. Um, you know, I don't have a lot to add here. I do want to build uh, quickly on what Bentley said about relationships and give you some examples of how our team uh, has continued to leverage those relationships and our uh, example that I will uh, you know, continue to harp on. Uh, so after we, we built our relationships, we, we've, we've made an effective pitch based on our goals that we figured out. Do we stop there? Not, not quite. I mean, there's one more step. Uh, maybe two more steps. Uh, so even after this climate EO, the My Healthy Climate Plan was rolled out, we continued to offer our expertise and connections to the administration, particularly when it came to one piece of that EO, which was the, the Climate Council. So the, the executive order uh, uh, established a Climate Council, which requires the governor to appoint uh, people to that council. So we wanted to be as influential, influential as possible to that council and hope to achieve this by finding some strong candidates in our relationship network uh, that share our values, that fit what they're looking for uh, as, as a potential appointment, and then share those names with the, with the governor's team. So we've done that the last couple of months here since the rollout. Um, that's one way that the relationships with not only with, with that target I mentioned, but also your, your broader network, um, finding those, those names were critical for us. Um, you know, finally, I, I guess I'd say to, to keep that relationship strong, we've also um, we've planned to thank the public, the governor publicly. Now, a couple, a couple of different ways we can do this. We planned a series of, of C3 uh, nonpartisan ads, just highlighting her work, just so the public can see what she's doing. Uh, her team can see and uh, our appreciation 
um, kind of positive reinforcement, positive accountability, we call it. Um, it's always best practice. It's always good to, to have that thank you uh, for something, uh, for a policymaker that, that did something you agree with. Um, again, the, the, the accountability doesn't have to be you spending thousands on ads. It could be as simple as um, tagging them on social media, publicly thanking them for an awesome meeting or an awesome vote that you think. Um, that's perfectly okay. Or just, you know, writing an email, sharing, sharing your um, your agreement on that issue or, you know, your opposition too. there, there could be negative accountability. So you know, I just want to reinforce that, that that's always good practice. Um, you know, once you have a big policy win, you're not done there, finish it off with some, with some accountability. And with that one last time, get it back to Emily and she's going to explain how to keep these members and volunteers engaged. Yeah. You know, again, just like, just like Joe said, being, you know, thanking folks is really important. Um, but at the community level, we just want to make sure that at this point, we're still updating our members, our volunteers who worked hard on this issue. Um, we continue the momentum that we've gained through building movements and taking action together, um, leading up to the passage of legislation and executive orders. We've built trust within our communities. And at that point, we just continue to engage folks and continue to bring them up the leadership ramp of engagement. Thanks, Emily. Uh, yeah. And uh, thanks, Joe and Bentley and Nick. You guys are awesome. Um, that wraps our uh, the bulk of our presentation. Um, this is a lot of information and apologies again for the uh, the internet issues there, but hopefully it wasn't too choppy. And um, this is informative and you guys learned something about effective advocacy and the work that we do at MLCV. So um, we have, I think, about 20 minutes for questions now. Um, and uh, I, I know Miriam said to, to put them in the chat, so I see a couple here. Um, so feel free to ask us any questions about any of the content here um, or anything about us and our backgrounds and how we got into this work. i um, more than happy to talk about that too. Um, and you can direct any questions at all of us or specifically at Nick or Joe or Bentley or Emily. Um, so let's see. First one that I'm seeing here uh, from Catherine. How do you keep the faith in the, and I'm just going to read these guys and then, and then jump in. Um, how do you keep the faith uh, in the face of rejection? And how do you reconcile what can be accomplished in reality with what is most ideal, but far, but a far reaching result? I can jump in. Uh, I'd love to answer Catherine's question. If you guys want me to take the first crack at it. Um, I guess in the face of rejection, uh, there's two paths, I, I would say. Uh, one, the, um, what I kind of already mentioned earlier, I mean, there's, there's, there's multiple ways to get to an end, end result. Uh, at least in the state legislature, and I'm sure in Congress as well, but um, multiple ways to get there. You get rejected by legislative leadership, go around them. I mean, there's other ways, you know, do it administratively, do it uh, through local governments. Um, there's plenty of ways, you know, hopefully maybe if you have a federal administration on the federal level, you could, um, you can have, you can have uh, action there as well. Uh, don't stop there. Uh, I would say the second and, and the more fun way is you change the players. <laughs> so if you don't like the answer you're getting, uh, you develop a strong political action committee, a strong election uh, uh, network, um, and you, you play in the electoral arena. I mean, I know a lot of our work is C3, but some organizations like us can kind of, um, you know, get, get into the political side of things as well. And maybe you, you change the game a little bit and have a better answer uh, next time around. And, and I could add in a little bit too from my end on this, because you know, when you're working with community members, like it's, it's such an intimate thing to be working so hard to leave it all on the field and to lose. And losing happens. Unfortunately, it happens a lot in some states. Um, and so I would just say, you know, the importance of making sure that you're building a healthy movement and the importance of actually building like a culture of support um, with your volunteer base can really get you through a lot. Um, I want to give an example that's not directly from Michigan LCB, so I hope that's okay. Um, but it's from my time working for Planned Parenthood out in Maine. And, you know, there, there can be un, unspeakably high stakes. And in this particular example, you know, Mainers were really tasked with convincing um, Senator Susan Collins to save the Affordable Care Act. That meant that these volunteers we're running phone banks four days a week, four times a day for months and months and months. 
that has an incredible amount of emotional wear and tear. And whether or not you win or lose, what gets you there is an understanding of the value of the process. And I feel like there would be a great moment to like talk about Viktor Frankl here, but we won't. But understanding that even in loss, there is value in moving toward the world that you want to have. And when you create your team intentionally, with all of the heart in the world, a loss will not stop you. Yep, that's great. Thank you, Emily and Joe. Um, okay, going in order here from Elizabeth, uh, what student opportunities uh, do you, us, I assume, MLCV, anticipate uh, in summer 2021? Ooh, I'll hop in there again if you all aren't tired of hearing from me. So first of all, there's always great opportunities. If this is an area that you would like to practice in professionally, um, I would encourage you to look at our internship opportunities that exist across our organizations, across our departments. Um, and also, you know, there, there's always opportunities to be practicing those bread and butter pieces of community organizing. And, and especially even like let's, summer 21 is awesome, but also lame duck is coming up. And so anyone who wants to get involved, anyone who wants um, to talk about ways that they can learn a little bit more about advocacy on my end, I'm happy to drop my email address into here. Um, and please email me, let's connect and let's talk more. And I think fair to say that that goes for all of us as well. Um, happy to share any of our perspective and um, make connections and, and um, um, you know, share thoughts about, you know, different groups, different, different, different um, uh, work, working in Lansing, working in DC, et cetera. Thanks guys. Um, next question from Kate. Um, do you work with any indigenous groups? And if so, what does that look like? Uh, if not, is there a plan to include indigenous groups in environmental advocacy? I can I can start, and Emily may have, um, or or Emily and Joe may have um, things to say. But yes, we do work with indigenous groups. Um, a critical partner. Uh, one of the one of the biggest issues that we're working on right now with uh, with uh, tribal communities in in Michigan is the line five oil pipeline that crosses the Straits of Mackinac. And uh, that is, that's a, that, that's a critical, first of all, the whole pipeline uh, route from Superior, Wisconsin uh, to um, Sarnia, Ontario with, with both peninsulas of Michigan as the, as a shortcut through the Great Lakes region for this oil uh, jeopardizes tribal lands, um, fish and wildlife, um, not to mention the health of many Michigan communities. Um, but that Straits of Mackinac is so critical in terms of a, uh, really a subsistence um, fishing grounds for, for several tribes. And they have sovereign tribal authority in the Straits of Mackinac uh, to the point where there is a, an excellent case to be made that just the very existence um, of line five um, sitting there at the bottom of the Straits of Mackinac where Lake Michigan and Lake Huron come, come together um, is, is just an inherent um, risk to, to many tribes. And there's actually a, a, an authority called the Chippewa Ottawa Resource Authority or CORA um, that is made up of um, treaty fishing tribes, uh, including the Bay Mills Indian community, the, the Grand Traverse Band of Ottawa and Chippewa Indians, the, the um, Little River Band of Ottawa Indians and, and several others. And so um, they have so much knowledge uh, for us. They have often the strongest legal arguments. Um, so both, it's not only the right thing to do to um, be working with them and have them, have them lead, but it's also strategically uh, advantageous in that particular instance. So um, that's just one, the w one example. Also student groups, please, if you are a part of, you know, a student group in this area, I would love to connect with you. Um, there's a ton of ways to take action and um, we're very eager to expand who we're working with. Thanks guys. Um, okay, uh, next question uh, from Judy. How do you avoid partisanship, especially with issues uh, facing the environment, which recently leaned pretty left? 
I can take a, a stab at this and if anyone else wants to weigh in. Um, so I myself have actually never worked for a party. I have chosen to do my macro social work practice um, in issue-based settings. And so I've just completely let go of those words. Like they don't exist in my day job at all. We're talking about conservation champions or people who are not conservation champions. And although I'm aware obviously that there are, you know, some popular issues amongst the parties, that's for over there. That's for over there, that's for someone else. It's my job to say, you know what, this isn't about politics. This is about the issues that matter to each of us. And I can remain focused on that by just sticking to my issue, conservation champions. Yeah, I think that's right, Emily. I think uh, emphasizing the nonpartisan nature of our work, um, you know, I think our, our endorsement process is important. I think people look at that and we do uh, endorse, um, you know, candidates on both sides of the aisle based on issues. I mean, we, we really try to remove the part of, uh, partisan nature of it. And then just de-escalating suspicion from, from uh, one side of the aisle or another uh, and really, um, you know, trying to meet with them maybe even before they get to Lansing and before they're ingrained in that partisan environment before they have a, a notion of, of what um, each organization, what side each organization is on or whatnot. Uh, meeting with them one-on-one, uh, -on -one, you know, building that relationship early really does help to de-escalate the, the suspicion. Thanks, Emily. That's great perspective. I think this is also an area, just not even speaking about from MLCD, but just as a as a you know citizen, a person who can you know who cares about their community, their environment. It's a perfect example of you know. Um, no matter where you live, I mean, in, in Ann Arbor, you know, we live in a, in a place, uh, not everyone on this call is in Ann Arbor and Emily's not, but uh, where, you know, our elected officials care a lot about the environment and, and uh, but it's not the case everywhere. And a lot of people care about the environment uh, in, in other places. So I think it's, it's a, you know, perfect example of um, when people can make a difference in their community, you call up your legislator and, you know, no matter their party, um, you tell them what you care about and, and that can, can influence them um, and, and influence decision makers. So, uh, uh, a lot of ways to, to do that. Um, next question from Cindy. Uh, do you sometimes have to have different messaging on a different issue for different audiences, i.e. different political parties? Um, do you have an example of that? Absolutely, every day, <laughs> every day. Uh, I'll kick it off here. And I know I saw uh, Nick, Nick Akapeni jump back on. I think he'd be a perfect one to answer this too. But yeah, you got to speak different languages depending on your audience, um, whether you know, the, the folks Kiff mentioned representing Ann Arbor will be receptive to our, um, you know, our work for the sake of the birds and the bees and, and you know, uh, clean air and public health for everyone. But not, not everyone naturally is going to be receptive to that. You know, you got to speak um, about jobs, recovery, sometimes even free market principles with some of those libertarians Nick was, uh, Nick was mentioning. Um, I'll kick it over to Nick. I know he's got some thoughts on this. He's probably chomping at the bit to, to, to chime in here. No, you, you got it exactly right. I mean, um, it's finding the language that best matches the, the worldview of the person you're speaking to, but in a way that's earnest and honest. Because it's the moment you try to uh, step into a language you don't kind of, you're not comfortable with, or that is, that comes from a place of, you know, it's a little bit opaque or, or even dishonest, it doesn't work. It's not effective. So um, on the clean energy, for example, we are very confident and we're advocating for energy efficiency. And now utility scale of clean energy, it's going to not only create jobs, but it's going to drive down costs for ratepayers, And it's going to grow businesses in the meantime. So we argue that uh, forward with the folks that care the most about those issues. And we do it every day. As far as examples, we, there actually was a recent example I think we could highlight here. Um, you know, there's a recent legislative fight to prevent uh, upstart EV um, electric vehicle manufacturers from being able to facilitate sales in Michigan, um, which have really, really hurt the industry as a whole. Um, so we partnered with some, again, going back to the non-traditional coalitions and partnerships, we partnered with uh, a lot of different folks that we, you wouldn't suspect uh, we'd, be, we'd be working with. Uh, even the Mackinac Center for Public Policy, a, uh, a free market think tank, we were side by side with them, uh, lobbying in Lansing, 
you know, they were making the, the free market argument to their folks that we were receptive. We were making our argument to our folks. And one of our biggest uh, allies in that fight was a really conservative uh, representative from West Michigan, Representative Steve Johnson, who's probably, his voting record is probably the most conservative in the House. Uh, if not, then he's in. The, he's got to be in the top top one or two. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, with non-traditional allies, we you know, as long as we get to the same end goal, it doesn't necessarily matter how we get there or why we get there. Yeah, maybe one more fun example. So, the Michigan Manufacturing Association is a very powerful, large business group in Lansing that we often buy heads with. They're typically anti-regulation, um, particularly in the environmental sphere. Um, but there was a push earlier this year to undo. Uh, the bottle bill in a way that would pull money away from contaminated site cleanup. And the manufacturing association said, whoa, you know, we don't want that to happen. Um, then we might have to cough up more money on our side of things if, if that money's not going for contaminated site cleanup. So we connected with them and said, okay, let's start lobbying members against the bill together. And, and we absolutely did. We carried, uh, we, we, when we talked with members, we said, hey, and the Michigan manufacturers are opposed to this. This isn't just an environmental thing. And that kind of thing happens often. Thanks, Joe and Nick. Um, so I think that wraps up our Q&A. Um, thank you everyone so much for joining this. Uh, this was so much fun. Um, again, thank you to Cindy for helping to organize this um, and to Miriam and to Liz for, for helping us uh, make this happen today. Um, we all had a great time. Uh, I know Miriam's gonna follow up with all of you uh, with um, follow-up information, including our email addresses. I think Emily and Bentley put them in the chat here too, but I'll, I'll make sure she gets all of them. Um, and thanks again. And Bentley, yeah. Before you go, Cindy, I was actually going to uh, talk about you because, oh. uh, <laughs> because you may know this already, but Cindy Bank is really uh, one of the most um, effective uh, lobbyists um, and just advocates in general. Um, that you can find. So we, you all, we all have an amazing asset with Cindy and her experience in, in especially in Washington D.C. and the relationships that she was able to build over just the years that I was there and got to know Cindy um, was remarkable. And she's really one of the most effective, and she did it in a way that was full of integrity and uh, authentic. So. Really, I think, Cindy, you know, we can learn a lot with you. And I'm so glad you're passing it along to um, my favorite school, University of Michigan. So I uh, just wanted to say that. Okay, now I'm totally blushing. But thank you, Bentley. <laughs> thank you all. And I really thank you, everyone from the League of Conservation Voters. Um, you, you hit on so many of the important pieces of identifying issues, um, getting your messaging, working to how to speak to audiences, and what you just talked about Bentley too, the, I think the most important piece are building the relationships. Um, and I hope that this will, you know, be one of the many times that we'll get to work with you all. Um, and I really um, appreciate everyone from the university who signed on. We had a really nice crowd. It fell off a little bit around five, but People have other things to do, but um, we, we have a really great crowd and everybody's voice, you know, we, we our, our vote was our voice and now our voice is our way to, is our power. And um, each voice does matter. And some issues, you know, take a long time. I once worked on a piece of legislation for, I think it was 15 years before we finally got it passed. Hopefully people don't have to wait that long to do things, but, um, Thank you all for the passion that you're doing in protecting our environment, our very special Mitten State and all its wonderful water and people. And um, like I said, I look forward to seeing you all soon. Everybody else um, look, look for other um, program and practical policy engagement programs. We've got one next week with the Michigan Municipal League on women leading local government, which will be a great event. Emily, would you like to join us? Love to have you. Um, and many thanks to my colleagues, Miriam and Liz. Um, really appreciate everybody doing this. And hey, go blue. Bye, thank you. Go blue. Go thanks. blue. thanks, guys.